Welcome to Cephistock Movie Recaps. Today we take a look at The Lord of the Rings, The Rings of Power, Season 1, if you are new on this channel please don't hesitate to subscribe, your support is what keeps us moving and you should know that your subscription is highly appreciated my dear friend, thank you. We began with a young Galadriel making a paper boat that is capable of sailing down the river just like a real ship would do, but sees it destroyed by the young boy playing by the river bank. Her older brother Finrod arrives and pulls her to one side to console her and tells her an important lesson. Poetically he explains the power and importance of always following the light. Do you know why a ship floats but a stone cannot, he asked. But after he says that it's because the stone only sees downwards, but the ship focuses more on the light, which helps it to float on water. Galadriel asks Finrod how she can know whether to follow the lights in the sky or those reflected in the water, Finrod's answer is a whisper only she can hear. We had no word for death, for we thought our joys would be unending, Galadriel tells us. But the, great foe Morgoth, put an end to such idealism. As the two trees of Valinor are destroyed, the elves sail east across the sundering seas to Middle-earth to battle Morgoth's orcs and to restore peace. Morgoth and his orcs are defeated, but the elves learned many words for death, and one of the fallen elves was Galadriel's beloved brother. The orcs are on the run but still commanded by Morgoth's most fervent disciple, Sauron, who Galadriel vows to hunt down. Burned into her mind is the wound Sauron sliced into Finrod's flesh, a three-pronged sigil, bathed in fire and blood. A sweeping pan over Middle-earth's landscapes and across centuries of searching finds Galadriel leading a band of elves up a snow-covered mountain face in Foradwaith, the northernmost waste. Over the objections of Thonder, she pushes the party through a blizzard and into a massive ruin of jagged stone. While surrounded by orc corpses embedded in the walls, Galadriel finds the three-pronged sigil carved into the stone, a sign that Sauron survived. But before she and Thonder can resolve their dispute over whether to go home as the king commanded or press on, a giant bearded snow troll with curved horns growing out of his noseless face begins tossing elves into walls. Galadriel is in charge for a reason, she catapults herself off of Thonder's sword to slice at the troll, then takes it down single-handedly with a sword to the throat and a knife to the head. We should never have come in here. That's Commander Galadriel to you, maybe not to Thonder, though, as Galadriel sheathes her blade, he lays his down, leading an extremely elvish mutiny as they all ceremoniously put down their swords and tell her that she moves on alone. In Rovanian, the wilderlands east of the Anjuan, a pair of hunters with enormous part wing, part moose antler appendages on their back trek the green and hilly landscape. A foot. Half foot. Uh, watch yourself. Danger. Mm -hmm. Come on, rattle your dags. As they move on, the Harfoots, a type of hobbit, creep out of hiding, popping up from tall grasses and out from tree trunks. A whole hobbit village shakes off its camouflage to come to bustling, gossiping life. Sadik Burrows is ill at ease, it's uncommon for hunters to come this far this early. Meanwhile, the Harfoot kids are outside the village, picking wild berries in the charge of Nori Brandyfoot. It's idyllic, until a little Harfoot gleefully shows Nori a huge, clawed footprint in the mud. She sends the kids quickly home just as a big, furry, and sharp-toothed creature comes into view. To Linden, capital of the High Elves. A young Elrin sits riding in a yellow-leaved tree when a messenger seeks him out. Bad news, he's not invited to the next council meeting, since he's not an Elf Lord. Good news, his friend Galadriel has arrived, swathed in a shimmering gold gown and sumptuous green velvet, she cleans up well when not battling snow trolls in an evil blizzard-beaten fortress. She tells Elrond about the sigil she found in the stone and that she wants the king to send her back out, but Elrond warns her not to disobey the king again. Back to the Harfoots. Unlike the rest of the happily pastoral Harfoots, Nori can't help but feel there's wonders in this world that they haven't yet seen. But her mother, Marigold urges her daughter to find satisfaction there in their village, the Harfoots are the only creatures of Middle-earth who are just responsible to their community, and that relationship is how they survive. That is how we survive. Help your father. 
supposed to be round. Back in Linden, Galadriel is feeling the tug of her own responsibilities. She and her company kneel in their armor as High King Gil-galad honors them for their efforts. In the words Elrond wrote for him, the king insists that the days of war are over. Today, our days of peace begin. Galadriel is unconvinced and even less enthused by the reward, the heroes will be escorted to the Grey Havens, her sun-soaked childhood home, to dwell for all eternity in the blessed realm, the far west, the undying lands of Valinor. At last, they are going home. While fireworks burst over the lake, Galadriel gazes at a statue carved into a living tree, one among many, each lit by the soft glow of a lamp, a memorial grove honoring her brother and those who died with him in battle. Elrond arrives to ply his friend with wine, but Galadriel is in no mood to celebrate. She can't go home, not until she's rid the world of Morgatha's evil. As Elrond promises that he will take up her task if the evil resurfaces, the memorial lights stretch out in both directions behind them, further than the eye can see, a reminder of how much has already been lost. In the Southlands, the lands of men, no one seems happy to see the two elves making their way through town. Arinder arrives at a tavern for his bi-weekly check-in and finds the locals discussing a poisoning. When he asks for more details on the poisoning, and is unconvincingly rebuffed, Rowan shouts at, knife ears, rude, that, one day our true king will return and pry us right out from under your pointy boots. Arinder goes out back to share a charged moment with Bronwyn, a local healer, who seems way happier to see him than anyone else in town. Where did you find these? We crushed the petals to form a cell. What we call them artificers. Would so? It is their labor and the beauty has great power to heal the soul. That was beautiful. But Medhor reminds Arinder that the elves are here to monitor the town, not flirt with its inhabitants. Elves and humans have only attempted to pair up twice, and both times were tragic, the odds are against Arinder and Bronwyn sharing anything more than significant glances. The chances don't improve upon their return to their outpost, the High King has declared the war over and disbanded the far outposts. Rev Ion, the Watch Warden, finds Arinder moping atop a watchtower. Rev Ion warns him that they've been assigned to watch these people because of their allegiance to Morgoth. Arinder should be glad never to see them again. But there's one person Arinder absolutely has to see again. He finds Bronwyn at her house and says that he has expressed his feelings for her a hundred times over, in every way but words. But before he can actually use those words, a man brings his cow to be healed, and the inky black goo that Arinder milks from it absolutely kills his mood. He and Bronwyn set out east to check out the area where the cow last grazed. This might be related to the mysterious poisoning the tavern goers were discussing. Bronwyn's son Theo and Rowan, the angry boy from the tavern, sneak into a barn while Rowan taunts Theo about his missing father. Theo is barely listening, though, because he has a task at hand. From under the rickety floorboards, he pulls out a broken sword he's been hiding and that is clearly exerting a mysterious influence over him. The hilt is surrounded by twisted metal, and on the blade is the telltale sigil of Sauron. If there's one thing Elrond is going to do, now or thousands of years from now, it's send a woman to the Grey Havens without giving her all the information. As Galadriel and her company sail across the sundering seas, Elrond and King Gil-galad discuss what they foresaw and kept from her, that if Galadriel stayed in Middle-earth, she might keep the evil alive rather than defeating it forever. Galadriel sails to the sunset, King Gil-galad says with a glint in his eye. You and I must look to the new sunrise. He tells Elrond he'll be working with Lord Celebrimber, the greatest of elven smiths, on a new project. It sounds suspiciously like a quid pro quo, but we'll have to wait along with Elrond to learn more. On the Sundering Seas, the elves are nearing the Grey Havens. They have their weapons and armor ceremoniously removed, although Galadriel cannot at first give up her sword. A flock of white seabirds bursts through the clouds and encircles the boat while the elves break into harmonious song. As the ship sails on and the song crests, the wall of grey clouds before them parts, and breathtaking golden sunshine streams through the cleft. 
But Galadriel cannot rejoice in this homecoming. She hears her brother's voice again, asking, Do you know why a ship floats and a stone cannot? At this moment, a fiery meteor rips through the clouds. The elves on the boat see it, in the Southlands, Arendar and Bronwyn instinctively clasp hands as it burns its path across the sky. Galadriel backs away from the blinding golden light as sea spray falls like rain, like tears, as her younger self asks the same question, how is she to know which lights to follow? We now hear the answer that was only whispered before, sometimes we cannot know until we have touched the darkness. She has, and now she knows. Galadriel dives overboard, into the water, the shimmering light above her, and surfaces just in time to see the wall of clouds closes again, shrouding the sea and her in darkness. King Gal Galad saw the meteor too, he picks up a golden leaf in its wake and sees its veins turn black and corrosive. But nearest of all to the fireball is Nori, who watches it hit the ground near her village and explode. Ever curious, she follows it to the site of impact, where she finds an unexpected sight, a nearly naked man, curled up in the center of the fiery hole. Meanwhile, episode 2 begins with Galadriel, alone, treading water in the middle of the sea, her ship and those aboard it safe behind the veil of clouds in Valinor. She takes off swimming. In Rovanian, Nori stands gaping at the unconscious figure in the burning crater, when Poppy startles her and Nori falls into the blazing hole but somehow not hot. She pokes the bearded mystery man directly in the face. At first, nothing happens until suddenly, he grabs her wrist and moans. The wind kicks up, swirling around Nori and the stranger. The rocks fly into the air, orbiting the two figures like a strange solar system. The fire is suddenly sucked into the middle and disappears, after a moment he collapses and the fire returns. The girls wheel the unconscious man through the night with a stolen wheelbarrow and lamps, looking for a place to keep him safe. Poppy asks Nori is he a troll? No. An elf? Wrong years, and he's not handsome. Human. No way, he'd be squished. But they can't debate too long, the wheelbarrow escapes them and rolls downhill. Good old-fashioned hobbit hijinks. Once they catch the runaway wheelbarrow, they hide the stranger in a clutch of trees. Nori pleads with the skeptical Poppy in language that echoes Galadriel's own driving sense of duty. I feel like he's my responsibility, I was supposed to find him, me. She has to know he's safe before she can walk away. In the Southlands, Arinder and Bronwyn in Hordern, Bronwyn's now destroyed hometown. There are no bodies, no wounded, no sign that anyone was present for the destruction. They creep through collapsed and still smoldering houses, seemingly alone in the smoky dark. Inside a ruined home, Arinder spots a deep pit and passage dug under the floor, clearly purpose-built by someone, or something. With one last longing look, Arinder sends her off to warn her people while he jumps down into the tunnels, torch aloft. In the meantime we get to be introduced to a new location. The region, realm of the elven smiths, is a city of towers built into the mountainous side of an island. In Celebrimber's chambers, he fills Elrond in on his project. Celebrimber aspires to fill Middle-earth with beauty, not just war, and to devise something of real power. He has brought Elrond here to help build a forge, one with a fire, as hot as a dragon's tongue and as pure as starlight. But he needs it done by spring. Elrond suggests seeking partners outside the confines of our own race. Now we move to Khazad-dum, realm of the dwarves. Thousands of years in the future it will become an orc-infested, Balrog-cursed, desolate tomb. But here in the Second Age, the streams still flow to the mines, cradled in lush green mountains. Elrond assures the smith that the dwarven prince, Durin, is like a brother, but the guard at the stone door quickly disabuses them of that notion. Elrond has another trick up his feathered sleeve, he invokes the rite of Sigintarek and the doors suddenly open. Elrond is hustled in alone, and sees the mines in their glory, waterfalls, green cliffs for farming in streaks of sunlight, and a bustling underground metropolis carved into the belly of the mountains. 
Prince Durin four bats away Elrond's flowery language about their friendship to introduce the dwarven test of endurance. They'll break stones with hammers until one of them can do no more. If Elrond forfeits, he's banished. If he wins, they'll grant a single favor. The elf does. <laughs> Did he lose? Banished. Yes. Understood. <laughs> Here we go, elf. Just as Elrond crushes his first boulder, we cut back to Nori. She finds the stranger drawing designs on a nearby boulder. He turns, yelling, and the trees surrounding them bow down toward him. You remember me, don't you, Nori pleads. Something in him does, and the world returns to its natural state. Through creative hand gestures and frankly gross snail eating, they forge a friendship. Where is it you're from, anyway? Where do you belong? Where are the others, like you? Are there any others? Nori asks. In answer, the stranger begins drawing a symbol in the mud, alongside others carved into the trees. He speaks in an unknown language, repeating, mana, and, you're, with increasing urgency. Meanwhile, Nori's father Largo is helping to set up a canopy at camp. At the height of the stranger's agitation, Largo's ankle spontaneously gives way. His foot is in a bad way, and the whole camp is anxious, wondering if he'll be able to migrate. How bad is it? Can he migrate? You mind your own fire, Malva. Back in the sea, Galadriel is still swimming, surrounded by impenetrable grey fog, when she hears a bellow. A decrepit raft comes into view, and she is pulled aboard. Galadriel says simply that she was separated from her ship. So you've not seen it, asks Aemon trepidatiously. The worm. Before either can get answers, the passengers spot a ship in the distance. Is it Deliverance? Corsairs. It's neither, it's their own wrecked ship, dragged through the sea by the feared worm, an enormous creature with fins that slice through the water. The passengers panic, and one of them shoves Galadriel back into the sea. Each time she comes up for air, we catch a glimpse of the destruction, the worm circling back, its huge jaws rising out of the sea to chomp down on the raft, its many fins ripping through the raft, sending debris and people flying. And then the sea is still and silent. In the distance, the last remaining bit of the raft cuts through the fog, rowed by Halbrand, who pulls her aboard. Once again, the various races of Middle-earth must strike a tenuous bond. Back in Khazad-dum, that bond is breaking like the many boulders Durin and Elrond are ferociously hammering until Elrond finally forfeits. A dog may bark at the moon. Take your lead. Willing to escort me to the exit. As they ride up a rock face to the exit, Elrond learns just how he's offended his former friend, 20 years may be the blink of an eye to an elf, Durin shouts, wounded. But I've lived an entire life in that time. A life you missed. Elrond offers only his congratulations on the milestones he's neglected, and a request, he'd like to apologize to Durin's family as well. Durin's wife Dissa welcomes Elrond with an overwhelming warmth her husband cannot offer. Over dinner, she shares how she and Durin met, she was resonating, a practice where the dwarves sing to the stones to learn what might be hidden, where to mine, where to tunnel, and where to leave the mountain untouched. Charmed by their affectionate home, Elrond notes the yellow tree from Linden that grows improbably in the room. Where there is love, it is never truly dark. How could it not grow in a home like yours? Elrond asks. It's enough, Durin tells Elrond to stay. On the seas, Galadriel wonders what kind of man leaves his companions to drown, while Halbrand thinks she's a deserter. She asks what elves have ever done to cause his animosity, but his response chills her, it wasn't elves who chased me from my homeland. It was orcs. As a storm rolls in, darkening more deeply the already grey sky, he reveals that he's from the Southlands. 
In the Southlands, Bronwyn comes back with bad news telling the people at the tavern that there's danger coming so they should move to safety at the Elven Tower, her news is met with skepticism. Waldredge won't flee with only her word to go on, he's seen landslides less dangerous than a wayward tongue, and the tongue of a woman who trusts elves is not worth much in this town. But at home, Theo hears mice under the floor. He attacks the floorboards, only to peer through the hole and see the ice blue eye of an orc peering back. Arinder is still crawling along the tunnel when the spindly shadow of some creature he surely does not want to meet looms on the wall. Rats scurry past as he squeezes through a passageway and slides down into an underground lake. He clambers to shore and watches the surface, ready to strike. He's unprepared for the long fingers that emerge from the roots behind him and drag him away. When Bronwyn arrives, her home is in shambles and there's a pit in the middle of the floor. She finds Theo hiding in their walls, then hides herself in the closet opposite, just as the clawed fingers, raspy breath, and skull-clad head of an orc emerge from the hole to prowl their room. The orc bursts through the closet doors to grab Bronwyn. They fight, the orc is vicious, but Bronwyn and Theo are resourceful and determined. When next we see the orc, it's just a head that she's slammed onto the tavern table as proof and or pudding, as Waldreg requested. If there are any of you here who want to live, we make for the elven tower at first light, she declares, then moves away. In the seas, Galadriel and Halbrand are in the middle of a storm. The waves lash and roil their rickety raft, and they work together to hold it, and each other, together. Galadriel has bound herself to their makeshift mast and tells Halbrand to bind himself to her. But before he does, the raft breaks apart and Galadriel sinks through the water. Halbrand cuts the rope that ties her to the anchored wood and brings them both thrashing to the surface. Near the Harfoot camp, Nori has come to tell the stranger that they're migrating soon, and she can't help him. His strange magic affects the fireflies in their lanterns, and they burst free, spilling upwards like embers from a fire. He gently whispers in his unknown tongue, and they form a yellow constellation in the sky. Nori understands, he wants their help finding these stars. But after the still weak stranger collapses, the firefly in Poppy's palm dies, and all the twinkling yellow lights blink out. In Khazad Dumb, Prince Durin tells his father that Elrond doesn't know what the dwarves have. King Durin III, Peter Mullen, with skepticism and a truly spectacular waist-length grey beard, is not so sure. There can be no trust between hammer and rock, he warns his son. Eventually one or the other must surely break. Two guards open a box in front of them. In the Southlands, Theo pulls out the broken rusted sword he's been hiding, and as it whispers to him, he sees a glimmer of fire in the shattered blade. Just then, an oozing trickle of blood pulls itself from the wound on his hand and inches toward the sword like an earthworm. As it makes contact, it hisses and sizzles, turning the flicker of fire in the sigil into a blaze. But rather than giving off smoke, it seems to inhale it, turning the smoke to metal, beginning to remake itself in front of Theo's eyes. Just as they escape the town, Galadriel and Halbrand have escaped the storm. They are unconscious on their raft and it drifts into the shadow of a large ship, a mysterious caped figure on deck silhouetted by the finely shining sun. In the meantime, episode 3 begins with a hardly conscious Arinder, last seen being pulled through an underground curtain of roots, is dragged through dirt-walled passages teeming with skull-clad orcs and their captive humans. With an orc hiss of, for Adar, Arinder is chained and tossed into a group of human prisoners who are digging a passageway, exposed tree roots reaching out to them like orc fingers, caging them like gnarled bars. He is helped up by another elf, Arinder's cheeky patrol buddy Medhor and the watch warden Revayan are captives here too. Screams of prisoners echo in Arinder's ears. In the seas, Galadriel awakens in the belly of a ship as if from a nightmare. Saviors or captors, she asks Halbrand. When they emerge onto the deck, the answer remains unclear. Their captain, presumably the caped silhouette from last week's cliffhanger, 
is taking them to his home for guidance, and he's wearing Galadriel's blade. One of the Elm obliged to deliver you safely to my betters. They will answer your questions, not I. To what port do we sail? See for yourself. As Halbrand marvels at the waterfalls and carved giants of this new land, Galadriel has pieced it together. They are in, the land of the star, the westernmost of the all-mortal realms, the island kingdom of Numenor. The boat lowers its sails like wings as it passes through an arch into port, all whitewashed buildings, climbing trees, and sea blue. Galadriel tells Halbrand that these people fought on the side of the elves, who rewarded them with the island. But Numenor broke that relationship, and elves have been unwelcome ever since. This is made abundantly clear by their hostile reception from Queen Regent Muriel, clad in sparkling jewel-toned scales like a fish. Galadriel, so good with a sword but so bad with diplomacy, demands a ship to Middle-earth, reminding them that it's the elves who gave them the island. It takes Halbrand's surprisingly smooth tongue to defuse the situation. The, companions by chance, will be Numenor's, guests, while the queen weighs the request. Before they are escorted away, Halbrand gives Galadriel her blade stolen from the captain. Meanwhile, Muriel asks her advisor Farazan about the captain who brought the unwelcome pair ashore. He is Elendil, a guard of noble blood, who has a son, Isildur who is part of a crew of cadets, working to become a member of the Sea Guard. It's just nine days before the sea trial, but this may not be the life he wants to dive into. Elendil's name means, one who loves the stars, but the queen knows it also means, elf friend, and she wants to know which meaning is truest for him. To test his loyalty, she asks him to perform a mysterious service. In the Southlands, where Erendir, caked in grime and blood, learns that the orcs are ransacking villages, looking for something for their revered leader, Adar, the captive elves wonder if this elvish word is one of Sauron's many names. Has Morgatha's disciple returned at last? The elves hatch a plan to escape, but before they can enact it, Revion defies the order to tear down an ancient tree. His company is given water in return for his show of strength, but some terrible game is clearly afoot. When Medhor drinks deeply, an orc strikes with whip-crack speed, slashing his upraised throat. The orcs laugh as Medhor collapses, still drinking before he realizes he's already dead. Arinder takes an axe and climbs up the roots, which now stretch into the pit like pleading arms, and gets a view over the trench to the no-man's-land devastation above, trees uprooted, grass scorched away, smoke rising from the barrenness. He touches the bark, speaks what sounds like an apology, then begins to chop. Back to Numenor, where Galadriel, dressed in the flowing ocean blue of the Numenor people, her ears carefully concealed, flits above the guards from roof to roof, eyeing a boat. From the shadows, Elendil stops her, he has been charged with watching her. Galadriel would like him to shut up now, thank you very much, but when he speaks in Elvish, her attention is turned, where he's from, on the western shores, it's still taut. When next we see them, they are riding through a wide plain and along the sea. Galadriel is smiling unguardedly for the very first time, her hair and dress rippling behind her like the waves they gallop alongside. Halbrand wants a fresh start as a smith, but he can't have a job unless he earns a guild crest. He finds his mark in a tavern and steals a crest from a mouthy bully. But the mark and his crew follow Halbrand into an alley and knock him flat with two punches. Just when they and we think he's done for, Halbrand jumps screaming to his feet and single-handedly takes out all four attackers, including breaking one's arm in close-up. But even he has limits, namely, the tips of the spears from the approaching guards. Galadriel and Elendil arrive at the Hall of Lore, a library piled high with scrolls. The last king kept it from being torn down, and was forced from the throne for his loyalty to the elves, an exile in his own kingdom. The materials pulled for her include Sauron's sigil, as drawn by an escapee from a dungeon. Galadriel suddenly understands, it's not a sigil, but a map of the Southlands. 
Morgoth planned to create a land where evil would thrive in case he was defeated, to be built by his successor, Sauron. If Sauron has indeed returned, Galadriel warns, the Southlands are but the beginning. In Rovanian, the Harfoots are dancing through a dense and sun-dappled Middle-earth forest, costumed as fanged animals and crowned with grass and ivy headdresses. Sadik leads the merry march and a chant of, nobody goes off trail, and nobody walks alone. But Marigold isn't so sure. She fears they'll be left behind because Largo's foot hasn't healed. He is relying on Nori's persistence to keep them on course. Right on cue, she pops out of hiding elsewhere in the camp, absolutely plotting mischief. She wants to look through Sadik's book for her meteor man friend Stars. Nori says that, there's head sense and heart sense, but Poppy replies, there's common sense and there's nonsense. But when Nori blackmails Poppy with the knowledge that she put fireweed in Malva's toe cream, Poppy distracts Sadik so that Nori can get her hands on the star chart. It's just, um, everyone's waiting. Yes, yes. Almost done. Just a little left. Yes, no, I, I, I'll tell yourself and get yourself some chestnut pie. At the festival, Sadik honors those from prior migrations, who fell behind. In life, we could not wait for them, but here now, we welcome them to our circle, he says, and each lost Harfoot's name is greeted with a chorus of, we wait for you. Among the roll are five proud fellows, taken by landslide, intoned as Poppy proud fellow sits alone, eyes wet for the family she couldn't wait for. The stranger sneaks into camp and takes the star chart to an untended fire. By its light, he finds the lights he seeks, the stars of his constellation. But the festival fires begin to pulse, and the chart begins burning. The stranger panics, crashing about the half his size camp, calling for Nori, who is now in deep trouble. Nori is defiant, without friends, what are we surviving for, she asks. Heaven forbid we explore something new for once. Sadik won't decorate in the family, but their cart will travel at the back of the line. Honestly, Nori. Do you think you're special? You're just a child. I know I'm just one little harful. My darling girl. But the tallest milkweed gets snip. It's time to pack. Back in Numenor, Elendil and his children catch up about the eventful day in a fire-bright courtyard. But Galadriel isn't the only topic of discussion, as his far-off looks implied, Isildur wants to defer his sea trial. Elendil is not pleased, he wants his son to look forward, not back. In the dungeon this side of the Sundering Seas, Halbrand is grappling with the same choice. Galadriel visits to show him something else she found in the Hall of Lore, the winged symbol on the pouch around his neck. A man under that mark united the Southlands ages ago, might that same banner unite the Southlands against Sauron? Your people have no king, for you are him, Galadriel reveals. The armor that ought to rest upon your shoulders weighs upon your soul. Move forward, Halbrand, she seems to say. Past need not be prologue. While Halbrand's family sided with Morgoth and lost the war, Galadriel's people started it, she thinks that this pair of self-exiles can redeem their bloodlines if they go to Middle-earth, together. But it might not be so simple to leave. High above the sea of Numenor's glowing lights, Muriel visits her deposed father. It is here, father. The moment we have feared. The elf has arrived. Back in Middle-earth, the camouflage Harfoot migration caravan rolls along. Poppy carries her cart alone, while Largo struggles with the brandyfoots, they may all fall behind. But then the cart starts to shake, and the stranger emerges from behind it. Friend, he says simply before beginning to push the cart along the long trail. Nobody goes off trail, and nobody walks alone, because without friends, what are we surviving for? In the Southlands, friends are all Arander has back in the orc pit, where rebellion has exploded. Revion and Arander kick their chains into orc faces, and during a deadly game of tug-of-war, Arander runs nimbly across the taut chains, leaping off them to take down the ragged sun shelter with one blow, 
exposing the orcs to the skin-searing sun. Release the ward, an orc commands, and a snarling part dog, part boar, all fawn creature promptly rips out the guts of two prisoners before Erender binds it. <laughs> The felled tree offers its jagged roots up to him, as he is yanked backward, he sinks one into the leader's throat. Revion frees his own chains and takes off for home. But as Erender claws his way over the trench, Revion is standing stock still. He is struck with an arrow. As Revion falls to the earth he'll now rejoin, Erender is pulled screaming back underground. He is saved from certain death for a fate that may be much worse, Bring him to Adar, snarls an orc. A sea of skull helmeted orcs parts for a figure that looks more human than orc, wearing a familiar clawed glove on his left hand come into focus. We gather to welcome those who will live that future. Moving on. Episode 4 begins in Numenor. Mothers and their infants have gathered with Queen Regent Muriel in the palace. In this court we gather daily to hammer out our island's future. But at the blessing of the children, we gather to welcome those who will live that future, one as boundless as a sunrise over the rolling sea, she says, holding an infant. But the rolling sea will have its own say. The palace begins to shake, and suddenly a blizzard of white petals rushes into the hall. The white tree, the symbol of the watchfulness and the judgment of the Vala, is shaking its petals loose. As she watches, rooted to the spot like the tree itself, an enormous wave rushes over the island, crumbling its edifice, flooding furiously into the palace itself, submerging Muriel and the future she cradles in her arms. She opens her eyes in a sunlit and extremely dry bedroom. It is a perfect day, her lady-in-waiting announces. Muriel would likely settle for, not apocalyptic. The bully Halbrand smashed up is now stoking anger in a crowded courtyard, I say the queen's either blind or an elf lover, just like her father. Chancellor Farazan interrupts chance of elf lover, to pledge, I swear that elf hands will never take Numenor's helm. He sends wine to the crowd, trusting that a little lubrication will grease these alarmingly noisy wheels. In this suddenly celebratory mood, we get to see Farazan's son, Keeman chats up new apprentice Irian as she watches the crowd. Make you forget your troubles, so they say. In the palace, Muriel examines the scrolls Galadriel brought back from the Hall of Lore. Galadriel calls on her to reforge the alliance with the elves and fight Sauron, together. Muriel says this is the most surprising and ambitious proposal she's heard in weeks, but Numenor will not join the fight. The women began the scene on equal footing, but now Galadriel towers above Muriel from the dais, ringed by a halo of lanterns, looking every inch the elf ruler that Farazan promised would never rise in Numenor. She dismisses the queen regent's authority in favor of her deposed father. The result? She is locked behind the bronze bars of the jail, two cells down from Halbrand. On the ocean with the other cadets, Isildur looks across the sea to Numenor's rocky western shores. He hears the mysterious whisper again, Isildur, the sun golden coast calls to him. He lets slip his rope, and the sail master dismisses him, just as he hoped, but he also dismisses Isildur's friends. Back on land, Isildur's promise to get his devastated friends reinstated only makes things worse. Since I was big enough to hold an oar I wanted on that boat. I did everything I was supposed to do to earn it, Valandil shouts. And what did you do? What have you ever done but brood and blubber about your dead brother? Isildur slap him across the face and this ended their friendship. Also in real trouble, Erendur, chained in the orc's lair. At last, Adar comes into view, one side of his face covered in a spiderweb of scars. To our surprise and Arinders, he has the pointy ears of an elf. Adar kneels by an injured orc and smiles with what, on another face, might be gentleness as the orc's blood-red eyes open in a final rapturous, Adar, father, escapes his lipless mouth. Adar stabs the injured orc, 
holding his gaze until he breathes no more. Adar asks in Elvish, where Arinder was born. You have been told many lies, Adar says. Some run so deep even the rocks and roots now believe them. To untangle it all would require the creation of a new world. Like a kingdom of evil in the Southlands. But that is something only the gods can do, and I am no god. Adar says. At least not yet. Adar gives Arinder a message to carry back to the Watchtower, where streams of Southlanders are greeted by Bronwyn, who has taken charge. Rations are running low, and Theo suggests a run back to town to get food. But Bronwyn will not send her son into danger. You can either help me, or you can make it harder, she warns. Unsurprisingly for a headstrong mother's headstrong son, who also happens to be in possession of an evil whispering sword trying to remake itself, Theo chooses harder. He goes back to the abandoned village anyway, and is quickly surprised by an orc. Theo holds out the broken sword to protect himself, which bursts into flame and begins reforging itself in the heat of violence. The orc yells to his company that Theo has the hilt. It's a boy! He has the hilt! Nobody sleeps! working together. Mark. What? Nothing, just... Based on Celebrimber's suspicions, Elrond has returned to Moria to find out what Durin is hiding. Dissa tells Elrond he can find Durin in the quartz mine, but Elrond doesn't buy it. Dissa's expansive warmth turns icy. Was there anything else you wanted to ask about, dearie? She inquires, but it sure sounds like, you can go now. But Elrond was right, he overhears Durin telling Dissa that they're making good progress in the old mine. In search of his friend's secret, Elrond descends into a hidden chamber, where he finds rocks riven with veins of glowing silvery purple. But before he can see more, Durin catches him, and demands Elrond's oath of silence before he'll fill him in. Elrond swears, hand to mountain, on the memory of his father. Durin shows Elrond the shining orc called Mithril, which is lighter than silk, harder than iron. Durin thinks it's the beginning of a new era for dwarves, but it's perilous to mine and has been restricted by the king. Durin gives the nugget to Elrond as a token of their mended friendship. But then the ground shakes and a cloud of dust fills the room, the earth has swallowed the four miners currently digging for Mithril. We sail back across the bridgetop canals of Numenor. While Keeman shoots his shot with Irian, Galadriel paces in her cell, mostly swatting away Halbrand's advice. Farazan arrives to inform Galadriel that she'll be shipped, literally, back to the elves tonight. She is released from her gilded cage into a circle of guards. But it's not only Halbrand who can defeat a gaggle of men single-handedly, in an instant, they've replaced her behind the bars. Galadriel marches straight into the deposed king's bedchamber. But she's greeted by the queen regent herself, gently tending to her ailing father. This vulnerability is enough to swamp the distrust between them, Galadriel even says, please, at one point. Muriel finally comes clean, when she was chosen to replace her father on the throne because of his allegiance to the elves, he brought her to the tower chamber where Muriel, swathed in a green of the forest rather than ocean blue, now brings Galadriel. She shows the elf what is hidden, the dark marbled orb of a palantir, one of seven seeing stones, passed on to Muriel along with a secret. Galadriel places her hand upon it. She finds herself inside Muriel's vision, but now it's Galadriel swept away by the crash of water. It is Numenor's future, Muriel explains, and Galdriel's arrival is what begins it. Galadriel argues that avoiding the war may be the thing that drowns Numenor. I know what it is to be the only one, the only one who sees, the only one who knows, Galadriel pleads gently. Perhaps neither of us have to bear that burden alone any longer. I beg of you, Muriel, choose not the path of fear, but that of faith. But Muriel cannot. Animals are all fled. Ah. 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 
He said he'd be right behind me. Stop pushing. She must be. Find him, but he's not in here. Over there, look. In the Southlands, Theo attempts to escape his destroyed village. But an orc catches him, and Theo is spattered with blood. It's not his own, Arinder has arrived and run the orc through. They sprint through the grey dawn of the forest, and as arrows slice through the air, Bronwyn arrives, searching for her son. Arinder holds off the legion of orcs until they arrive in a clearing, bathed in the rose gold of a sunrise, where the orcs cannot follow. Back in the mines, Dissa is resonating, her powerful voice echoing off the walls in a plea to the rocks to release the bodies of the miners with breath still inside them. Her song worked, Durin arrives with the news that all four are alive and free. But Durin's father shut the project down and wants the vein of Mithril sealed off, infuriating Durin. Elrin's own father was lifted beyond the bounds of this world, to forever carry the evening star across the sky. A great honor, and a great weight on the son left behind to grapple with his legacy and his absence. Inspired by Elrin's words, Durin asks his father's forgiveness for his pride and stubbornness. The king, gazing down upon his lamplit kingdom of stone and ore, will not hear it, forever am I with you, my son. Even in anger. Sometimes in anger most of all. There is nothing to forgive. The dwarves stay modeling healthy family relationships. They agree that Durin will travel with Elrin to Linden, to understand something more than what they've been told. At the tower, Arinder delivers Adar's message to Bronwyn, the people can live if they forsake the lands and swear loyalty to him. As they gaze down at the community of necessity Bronwyn has made, her son sits in the shadows. A hole of blackness ready to swallow him from behind, just as another darkness approaches, Waldreg reveals himself as a follower of Sauron who knows Theo has the hilt. He says the Starfall was a sign that Sauron's time is near. Theo will need his strength for what's coming. In Numenor, Galadriel boards the boat waiting to take her away, the second time she's unwillingly set to sea. As Muriel and Farazan walk through the streets, another blizzard of white petals begins to fall. But this is no vision, the tree is shedding its petals in truth, blanketing the kingdom in the valley's tears. Muriel understands its meaning. There is a fateful hour in the destinies of men, she tells the assembled kingdom. An hour of judgment in which each of us, every one, must decide who we shall be. She will escort Galadriel back to Middle-earth to aid the Southlands in their fight. The sons and daughters of Numenor, those living embodiments of the future, may volunteer to join them. A new great wave washes through the palace, one not of water, but of brave hands rising into the air. Who is willing to commit themselves to our queen region and make yourself known? I will serve! Moving on. Episode 5 begins with the Harfoots. Nori is teaching the stranger language, snails, and about the Harfoots' migrations. There's a hundred perils between here and the grove, humans, wolves, a variety of trolls. I'm Peril, the stranger says with alarm, remembering the extinguished fireflies in his palm. But Nori assures him he's good, a word he's much happier to learn. I'm good, 
he repeats. As the Brandyfoot party creeps through the gray marshes, across waterfalls and the braids, through thunderstorms and teas and shared laughter, Poppy sings, past eyes of pale fire, black sand for my bed and I trade all I've known for the unknown ahead. Images of the starfall suddenly burn through the song spell, the stranger at the crater's center like the dark pupil of an eye of fire. The fires have long since burned out, but its mystery hasn't. Above the charred hole, whispers in the wind carry us to three mysterious figures, pale-eyed and swathed in white. One climbs and places a hand above the crater's singed dirt. They feel, something. And they don't look too happy about it. My lord. Your arm. How does it feel? I wish. You could feel it. Soon it will be gone. Me and the new its warmth as well. I shall miss it. It is time. In the Southlands at the Tower, Bronwyn addresses the refugees, a burst of blue against the grey stone. I know I'm not the king you have awaited, but if you choose to stand with me and fight, this tower will no longer be a reminder of our frailty, but a symbol of our strength, she vows. But early success turns to mutiny. You will die. I say it'd be better to take our chances bowing to the supposed enemy, Waldred shouts. He calls Theo to follow him and dozens more as they stream out of the tower. Theo! It's our chance! It's our time! Come with me, come on, lad! Follow me, lad! In Numenor, ships preparing to sail to the Southlander's aid clog the harbor. Amid all the bustle and noise, Elendil is mostly giving Isildur the silent treatment. Isildur can't go west until he's done something worthy of Numenor, and he wasn't chosen to go on the expedition. Elendil will not help him, Isildur made his choice when he got himself kicked off the sea guard. But while half the city wants on the boats, the other half is screaming at Farazan to stop the war. Irian is one of them, and enlists Kiman with a tender hand on his arm. Halbrand, meanwhile, is forging a blade in the armory. He is summoned to Muriel. On Galadriel's assurances and over his protests, she trusts he'll be helpful when they make landfall. Left alone to their private battle, Galadriel and Halbrand argue over who is using who. It turns out the price of his guild crest was leaking Galadriel's plan the night she broke into the tower. Find another head to crown, he spits, breaking their uneasy alliance and ripping his people's sigil from his neck. The Harfoot migration trundles through an unnaturally barren forest. Leafless branches slice into the grey day, and Nori finds enormous wolf prints in the mud. But the biggest peril may come from within. Malva, always good for a gross dose of Harfoot humor, says, it's as plain as lip fungus, that, the big fella, is to blame for the tree's strange lifelessness. She wants the Brandyfoot party stranded, take their wheels and leave them. Way harsh, Malva. Sadik doesn't say yes, but he sure doesn't say no. None the wiser, Nori and Poppy find Malva to tell her about the footprints. Right on cue, the screaming howls of the wolf rip through the air, sending the women racing back to camp. But they're too late, enormous wolves sprint after them. One leaps at them, opening its dripping jaws to tear at Nori. But instead, it's lifted into the air and tossed aside by the stranger, who now stands between his friends and the animals. He pounds the earth and the wolves are flung away by the tremor. He has saved his friends but hurt himself, a serpent of purple-black winds from his wrist to his forearm. In Numenor, Valendil and Antimo practice sword fighting under Elendil's watch. He suggests Galadriel offer her expertise, just the invitation she's been craving. Come at me. We will see who can score flesh, she tells five trainees, and Elendil offers a promotion to anyone who can get a point on her. She flits away from Valendil's strokes without batting an eye, then bats away Antimo's blows like flies. All five rush her at once, and she slips through their swords like water without once losing her smirk. Your arms. Look. 
to outmaneuver them. Well done, Lieutenant. But Valandel manages to nick the material on her arm. Congratulations, Lieutenant Valandil. Speaking of arms, Keeman would very much like Irian to touch his again, so he works on Farazan to stop the expedition. When he insists that Farazan would rather die than take orders from an elf, it unstops his father's ears for once. When all this is ended, elves will take orders from us. Farazan wants to give the men of Middle-earth a king in Numenor's debt, the war is a tool for trade and power. It was capitalism all along. The stranger's daring do has changed the Harfoot's tune, but he doesn't hear Nori tell him so, he's working on a remedy for his wound, magically turning a puddle to ice. The chill climbs up his arm like frozen ivy, and Nori gets hers stuck in the frost. She begs him to stop, but he continues his incantation until she is flung through the air. The memory of his fiery fall to Middle Earth flashes as she plummets to the ground. He comes back to himself as Nori cowers and runs from his touch. At a candlelit forest dinner party in Linden, Elrin toasts the union of the elves and dwarves. King Gilgalad commends Durin on Khazad-dum's progress. Durin might note the same of Linden's swift expansion, typically takes you people weeks to decide, Elrin saves his friend by cutting him off and defusing the obvious tension. But after dinner, Elrin and Gilgalad each accuse the other of lying. The king leads Elrond to the yellow tree where he rewarded the soldiers with their homegoing. Sending Galadriel away didn't work, Black Blight is spiderwebbing up the tree's trunk and into its mighty branches, seeping into the veins of the leaves. The light of the Eldar, our light, is fading, Gil-galad says. Celebrimber later confirms, only Durance Mithril can bring it back and, just maybe, save the world from the gathering evil. Elrond is left holding his chunk of mithril under the stars, weighing the fate of his people against his vow to his friend. Back in Numenor, Isildur calls on his own friend Valander to get him on a boat. But like Elendil, love and history, and in this case, free punches, aren't enough to do another favor for a man who hasn't earned those he's already been given. Valander can't, won't, help. So Isildur stows away on a ship, just in time for Keeman to try to burn it down under cover of darkness. They tussle, and the boat explodes. Are you about to burn it? Hand me the lantern. Amid the raining fire and debris, Isildur swims to the dock, dragging a wounded Keeman, and is delivered into the waiting embrace of Elendil. Isildur covers for Keeman's attempted boat fire, bombing. Halbrand would like very much to stay out of war altogether. He is sweeping the armory when Galadriel comes with an apology and a plea, stop fighting me and together let us fight them. But he is still haunted. She doesn't know what he did before he ended up floating on a raft in the sundering seas. Galadriel shares with him her brother's words from centuries ago, sometimes to find the light, we must first touch the darkness. Halbrand is sorry for all she's been through, but she wants action, not sympathy. There is no lasting peace in any path but that which lies across the sea, she says, closing his necklace in his fist. In the Southlands, the deserters have reached their burned-out village and bent the knee to Adar. Lift us up from the muck and the filth to take our rightful place at your side, Waldredge grovels. I pledge my loyalty to Sauron. At the sound of that name Adar turns ferociously, a scar-marked ghost against the empty blackness of the sky. You are Sauron, are you not? In answer, Adar grabs Waldredge by the throat and throws him to the ground. It's all the same to Waldreg, I'll serve you, then, whoever you are. Adar grabs Rowan, forces him to his knees, and tosses a knife to Waldreg. Only blood can bind, Adar snarls over Rowan's terrified pleading. Before we see Waldreg strike, we're back in the tower, where Theo has chosen to stay, and to trust Arinder, by showing him the mysterious hilt. Arinder recognizes it, 
and pulls ivy from a stone wall to reveal its carved likeness behind the roots. It's a key, Erendir tells Bronwyn, something to do with Adar's desire to become a god. He believes they can survive the coming battle, but Bronwyn knows the way, give up. We're destined for the darkness. It's how we survive, Bronwyn says, her resolve broken as the torches of the orc stream ever closer. Also on the move, Durin's escort back to Kaza Dum through the Golden Linden Forest, as elves carry the heavy stone table he tricked Gil-galad into giving up. Elrond may have broken his vow, but can still keep faith with this friend, he admits that he came to Kaza Dum for Mithril, though he did not know it. He tells Durin that without it, the elves' only choices are to abandon Middle-earth or perish. Durin enjoys this unexpected power, then agrees to convince his father to let them mine it. Halbrand has also made his choice about whom to stand with. He's astride a horse, bathed in sunlight, and in water and soap, as the war procession marches on. Muriel watches, golden in her armor as petals fall around her, not the white petals of the Valas tree, but the red and pink and purple ones of her people. The procession moves onto the warships, and Isildur, having finally done a deed worthy of Numenor, is part of it. Plus, his father has once again secured him an important job, mucking out the stables. There are two other passengers aboard, Galadriel, trading rippling gowns for the armor she cannot put away, and a newly regal Halbrand. They clasp arms, sails unfurl, wind blows and the ship set off away from Numenor's sun-warmed shores, bound for Middle-earth and for war. Well, we kick off with the most brutal episode 6, Adar stands in front of a sea of fire, hundreds of orcs holding torches aloft in the night, with the murderous walled reg in the front row. Before this night is through, some of us will fall. For the first time, we do so not as unnamed slaves in faraway lands, but as brothers and sisters in our home, Adar calls out. War drums and the orcs guttural growls score their march to the elven fortress, Adar at their head. But when they push open the doors, the courtyard is abandoned. As the orcs search the fortress, Adar stares at the carving of the hilt in Sauron's skeletal visage. Groveling to his, Lord Father, Waldreg asks, what happened to Sauron? Adar turns, face as stony as the carving behind him. But before he can answer, Arinder pops up from behind a parapet, like the most graceful whack-a-mole you've ever seen, to fire arrows into the orcs below and into the rope that holds the tower's scaffolding together. He leaps down to the bridge with cat-like agility and takes off. Beams from the scaffolding fly off the tower as the ropes snap. As Waldreg begs an impassive Adar to move, the tower finally collapses in on itself, seeming to trap Adar and his army beneath its crushing, burning weight. From the valley below, the Southlanders cheer, but Bronwyn knows the fight's not done, they have to make the village ready. On the sundering seas, Numenor ships glide through the night. While Halbrand lies awake, Isildur rises to clean the stables and share an apple with his horse buddy Berek. He wanders up on deck, where armor-clad Galadriel, commander, to Isildur, spots him. Humility has saved entire kingdoms that the proud have all but led to ruin, she tells him as he admits with shame that his rank is stable sweep. Meanwhile, Elendil updates Muriel. It's a day's sail up the river and then another day's ride to the Southlands. She wants to make haste. Back in Southlands, Arinder hides the unbreakable hilt while the villagers booby trap their home. This 
beyond our skill to destroy. Where will you hide it? No one must know. Not even you. After a pep talk from Arinder, Bronwyn sends the fighters to their positions and Theo into the barricaded tavern to protect those inside who can't fight. Theo has chafed against his mother's protection and grappled with the hilt's influence. But now, he's a frightened boy who just needs his mom to tell him everything will be alright. While villagers hold their loved ones, their babies, each other, she tries, in the end, this shadow is but a small and passing thing. Find the light, and the shadow will not find you. She clutches and kisses her own baby before they say farewell. Arinder and Bronwyn share a moment of calm before the coming storm. He presses two of the Alfren seeds she gave him into her palm. It is a tradition among the elves. Before a battle begins, plant one, Arinder tells her. But she knows, new life, in defiance of death. Arinder places her hand on a tree and gently holds it. The rest we shall plant after the battle is over in a new garden, he whispers. You and I and Theo. Together. When Bronwyn asks for his promise, Arinder's only answer is to kiss her, finally, in the garden they have now. At night as the wind is blowing and a lot of silence. Arinder sees it, pinpricks of fire coming over the hill. The surviving orcs cross the bridge, and the battle commences. They return to the sound of celebrations, the villagers have declared victory. But when Arinder looks at the bodies, he sees something strange, red blood pooling beneath a fallen orc's helmet. He pulls it off to reveal not an orc, but a man. One by one, villagers remove animal skulls and chainmail masks to reveal their neighbors, friends, fellow refugees. Fires dance on rivulets of blood, black and red alike, spattering the sweat-soaked Southlanders as they realize what this means. Suddenly, arrows whistle through the air from the trees, felling Southlanders left and right, including Bronwyn.
Arinder carries her to temporary safety in the tavern, where her blood drips red through the planks of the table. Theo and Arinder treat her wounds with those same seeds and a burning piece of wood. But Bronwyn falls limp and silent. For a long moment, they watch her lifeless face. Finally, she stirs. Theo throws an arm around Arinder, who cradles Bronwyn's face. She and he and Theo. Together. For the moment, at least. Outside the tavern, the orcs have overrun the village, and an obviously not crushed Adar walks between the flames to the tavern. He asks Arinder for the hilt, but Arinder will only consider it if he lets the villagers go. In answer, an orc guts one. Then another. Adar looks to Bronwyn. Arinder still won't break, but as a blade arcs toward her neck, Theo does. Thunder rumbles as Adar lays his eyes on what he's been seeking. He leaves the tavern with the hilt and a job for Waldreg, only to find that it's not thunder, it's the Numenorean cavalry flooding into the village. They mow down orcs with chains, swords, spears, and hooves. Galadriel chases Adar through the woods, it was suspiciously easy for him to abandon his children. Just as she catches up, Halbrand arrives and trips Adar's horse, then skewers his grasping, unloved hand with a spear. You remember me? Halbrand asks. Adar does not. Did I cause someone you love pain? Adar whispers, smiling cruelly. Eat your tongue, Galadriel spits. But she wants Halbrand to put the spear down, she needs Adar alive. Back in the village, the captive orcs are chained, and Numenorians, their white-scaled armor splashed with black blood, are cleaning up. Valandil has gotten himself an Isildur spots in Galadriel's company hunting down escaped orcs. Sweet Summer Child Ontimo has seen enough battle for his whole sweet summer life and will be staying behind to help the villagers. Meanwhile, Galadriel interrogates Adar. She heard that Morgoth tortured elves into new creatures, the Sons of the Dark, the first orcs. Adar has one note, Uruk. We prefer Uruk. She seeks his master, Sauron. After Morgotha's defeat, the one you call Sauron devoted himself to healing Middle-earth, Adar claims. Flashes of the fortress in the snow, littered with the twisted skeletons of orcs. For my part, I sacrificed enough of my children for his aspirations. I split him open. I killed Sauron. Galadriel is not buying it, nor is she moved by his parental care. She kneels to his face, light reflecting off her silver armor, and with deadly calm vows to kill every orc. Before I drive my dagger into your poisoned heart, I will whisper in your pike deer that all your offspring are dead and the scourge of your kind ends with you. Ice cold, Galadriel. But Adar is unfazed. Perhaps your search for Morgotha's successor should have ended in your own mirror, he taunts. Galadriel is only stopped from killing him by Halbrand's arrival, 
leaving a thin ribbon of blood on his throat. Adar asks who Halbrand is, and Halbrand does not answer. Galadriel and Halbrand share a tender moment by the sun-dappled stream, at least, as tender as either of them can manage. Fighting side by side felt right to them both. Back in town, the villagers celebrate properly, pipes and drums underscore an outdoor banquet and the clinking of beer mugs. Arinder guides a grateful Bronwyn to the gracious Muriel, who introduces Bronwyn to Lord Halbrand. When she spies his winged crest, she immediately leads a cheer to the true king of the Southlands. Halbrand smiles, seemingly free of his burden. Arinder spies Theo sitting alone, feeling both guilt and the loss of the power the hilt stirred in him. They are a family now, and Arinder trusts him accordingly, he gives Theo the wrapped hilt to deliver to the Numenorians to toss into the sea, freeing himself from its hold. But the weight of it in Theo's hands feels wrong. He unwraps the burlap and finds a simple axe. At that moment, back at the crumbled watchtower, True Dirtbag and my sworn enemy Waldreg stares up at the carving of Sauron's face, the missing hilt in hand. Adar had a job for him, after all, and acted as a decoy to allow Waldreg to do it. The hilt is pulling black smoke into itself, reforging its blade from the blood of Waldreg's arm. He plunges the remade sword into the stone, it slides in as smooth as glass and turns. The stones all around him begin to rumble, and the river erupts, spilling over bridges, and careening down the mountain. Just as Isildur and Elendil finally share a moment of understanding in the valley, geysers explode throughout the village as the orcs chant, Yudin. Beneath them, the water crashes through the crude tunnels. They weren't only a way to sneak from village to village, they were a course for a new river, leading to a green mountain reaching into the sky. The water spills into a cavern of angry red lava in the mountain's belly, sending a new river of fire and smoke powering out of the mountaintop. Fireballs arc through the air and crash through the village, exploding the all-too-brief celebration in bursts of red and black. Elendil races for the queen, Isildur calls for Berek, Ontimo runs through the smoke. But one figure does not move. As Adar stood and watched the tower crumble, so Galadriel now stands amid the fires and destruction, watching as a wave of black and billowing smoke, shot through with blood red, crawls down the mountain and across the grass. The clouds of smoke blot out the sun but she stands still and swallowed within. We pick up episode 7 in the same exact place. An ash-covered eye opens. Galadriel pulls herself up and into a nightmare, the once green village is a hellscape. Everything, the very air itself, is red. Everything is coated in ash. The buildings are burning. A horse runs by, screaming and on fire. Bodies are scattered across the ground, tossed onto the tables that just moments before held a banquet. Survivors stagger, cough, and cry out. Galadriel calls for Halbrand and Elendil. Theo calls for his mother. Neither's call is answered. They find each other in the swirling crimson ash, and Galadriel leads Theo away from town. Elsewhere in the village, Isildur tries desperately to pry Valendil from under debris, with Muriel's help. As they drag him from the ruins, another set of eyes stares lifelessly into the red sky, sweet Antimos, who never wanted to fight at all. But there's no time to mourn, there are children trapped in a burning building, and Valendil, Isildur, and Muriel tear apart the walls and get them out. Muriel is thrown back by fire and a shower of sparks as the roof collapses in flames, seemingly crushing Isildur below it. Meanwhile, on the green and grassy migration, the Harfoots will soon know their own horrors. While Poppy sings a song about snailing, they finally reach the grove. But instead of apricots and apples, they find scorched trees and the ground black and smoking, more victims of Mount Doom. Sadik's elders used to talk about volcanoes that would fall dormant, only to wake again when a new evil is rising. Nori wonders if she's brought that new evil into the caravan. While Harfoots pick black and dried fruits from the ruined branches, the stranger runs his hands over the trunk of a scorched tree, muttering words that seem to wake the wind. But they also wake the tree, its charred bark cracks, 
revealing new life underneath, and the fruits turn bright again, but then it's too much, and a huge branch falls, trapping Nori beneath it. The stranger looks wounded, and Nori looks mistrustful. This friendship isn't healing anytime soon. In Khazad Dum, Elrond makes his case to King Durin III for Mithril. He's brought the poisoned leaf from the great tree in Linden, as well as riches and the promise of timber and grain in exchange for access to the mines. But it doesn't matter what Elrond promised or how much he means to Durin. He will not agree to mine Mithril. We do not dig in earth that cannot support it, tempting shadow, rock, and mine to bury us all beneath the mountain, King Durin says. He is sorry. But he's not half as sorry as Dissa would like to make him. Lice-bearded, uncaring old fool, she shouts, pounding the living daylights out of a glowing axe fresh from the forge in their living room. But Elrond will not say farewell, only, Namory, go toward goodness. Durin mournfully slides Elrond's returned mithril across the table. But instead of flying off, it stops, held still by the rotting leaf on the table. Suddenly, the poison in the leaf's veins recedes, and its brilliant yellow returns. Durin and Dissa joyously call Elrond back. But the Southlands cannot be healed so easily. Survivors, including Elendil trudge through the dead forest under a sickly yellow sky. The queen, bloodied and shell-shocked, arrives with Valendil, but without Isildur, and without her sight, shrouded in the darkness her father warned her of. Elsewhere, Theo and Galadriel pick their way through the skeletal forest to rendezvous at Numenor's camp. She promises to help make Theo a soldier, and she replaces the twisted and corroded hilt he's used to holding with her own shining sword. Moving to the Harfoots, Sadik sends the stranger over the ridge to the Big Folk Settlements and gives him the star chart with the mysterious constellation, hoping the humans can help him. The stranger heads in one direction, Sadik in another, but the stranger's influence remains, a yellow flower blooms brightly in the singed trunk of the tree. Nori offers him a precious apple, big and red, for the journey. Even if he's a peril, after all, she can't send him away empty-handed. He takes it, without a word, and disappears over the hill. Crouching under a fallen tree, Theo asks if Galadriel has ever lost someone close. My brother, Finrod, she replies, and my husband. Celeborn. A significant timeline change, or foreshadowing. Either way, it's big news. Theo wants her to stop blaming herself, mostly so that he can blame himself instead. But Galadriel will not have it. Do not take the burden of this day upon your shoulders, she warns. You may find it difficult to put it down again. She knows a thing or two about being unable to let go. Stop. Nothing but ashes. Uh, we're wasting time. Best way you can. Back in the mines, Durin digs furiously into the stone while Elrond watches. A tremor stops them, it's not the first one, and they pause to let the stone settle and to share a tender moment of chosen brotherhood. When Durin finally breaks through the rock wall, they find a silvery vein of mithril that stretches down the cavern and into the mountain floor like roots. But as they celebrate, King Durin happens upon their illicit operation and unceremoniously tosses Elrond out of Khazad Dumb. But clasped in Elrond's fist is his chunk of mithril, he knows now what is possible. Back in the mines, the king and Durin finally have it out. They accuse each other of betraying their people, one by siding with the elves and the other by clinging to the past, until the king pulls off Durin's armored crest and tosses it to the ground. Leave it. It's not yours anymore, the king mutters. So much for dwarves modeling healthy conflict. Poppy still singing about snails, munching on an apple in the morning light. Her joy has good reason, the burned trees are now crowned with green leaves and adorned with fruit. Berry bushes have sprung up from the singed dirt overnight. The stranger, it seems, has brought the grove back to bursting life. 
Apple saw. What do you got for me, Goldie? Come on, Apple Malibu. There you go. Oh, thank you, Malibu. Where's your sister gone? Uh, she's just there. They say he's little dog. But that night, Nori and Poppy watch as the mysterious figures shrouded in white approached the tree that the stranger healed, looking just as intense as they did at the meteor's crater. The dweller, Bridie Sisson, plucks the yellow blossom from the tree's trunk, and they walk in the stranger's direction, trampling the carpet of golden flowers he left in his wake. Always Nori has to find something out of nothing. She pops out to shout that the stranger went in the opposite direction. But these are no Harfoots, and they can't be fooled. As they tower over Nori and Poppy, other Harfoots try to scare them off. But the Dweller calmly places a hand around a torch's flame, killing its fire, then blows a snake of black smoke over their heads. All at once, the carts in the Harfoot camp, stuffed full of fruit, burst into flame. The Harfoots scream as their entire way of life goes up in so much smoke, one more home consigned to ashes. The survivors of another fire trudge into the Numenorean camp, nestled in a still green clearing. Elendil lets a restless Berek go, and he gallops away in search of his lost rider. I should never have pulled the elf on board, Elendil spits. I should have left her in the sea where I found her. Right on cue, Galadriel and Theo arrive at camp. Theo runs straight for the medical tent, full of bloodied and burnt Southlanders and Numenorians alike. He eyes a bloody shroud, but before his worst fears are confirmed, he hears his mother's voice. She's okay, and so is Erendur. The family is safe and sound and together, as Erendur promised. Queen Regent. On a rocky ledge, Muriel sits with Elendil, a red cloth bound around her unseeing eyes, as he presses for a swift exit. Galadriel arrives, seeking only to apologize for leading them into such pain. Do not spend your pity on me, elf, Muriel admonishes. Save it for our enemies, for they do not know what they have begun. Muriel vows that Numenor will be back, and Galadriel promises the elves will be ready. For Elendil's part, he can only stare tearfully across the land that swallowed his son. As the Harfoots clean up their torched settlement, Largo has no time for Nori's pity party. We're Harfoots. We stay true to each other, no matter how the path winds or how steep it gets. We face it with our hearts even bigger than our feet. And we just keep walking. Nori is stirred to action, her father's daughter through and through. She heads in the stranger's direction to warn him, and she won't be alone, Poppy and Marigold join her. And Malva wants Sadik, a trail finder, to go with them. What's the good of living, Sadik, if we aren't living good? She asks. Sadik agrees, and they're off across the hills. The Southlanders prepare to travel to an old Numenorean colony for a fresh start, and Galadriel will report to the High King. But first, she is brought to a tent to finally reunite with Halbrand found injured on the road. A bleeding and infected gash in his side reddens his tunic, and now he needs to visit the elves for healing. As he leaves the tent to ride to Linden, the Southlanders bow before him, chanting, Strength to the King. Strength to the Southlands. Keep it. Commander. Strength to the Southland! Durin and Dissa sit at home, drinking and commiserating. I've failed him, and it's all my fault, Durin laments, a refrain that has echoed across every corner of Middle-earth this episode. Fault and failure, forgiveness and fortitude. Dissa doesn't blame Durin, 
but his father, and with a fire in her eyes that is part fierce love and part Lady Macbeth, she insists that one day Durin will be king, and they will mine the mithril together. Meanwhile, King Durin tosses the revived yellow leaf through the wall of the Forbidden Mine. It floats past glittering veins of mithril before landing on the cavern floor and immediately burning to dust. The king isn't wrong. The dwarves will one day dig too deep, and they'll meet the Balrog in those depths, a demon of fire that now roars from the shadows over the ashes of the linden leaf. Back in the Southlands, Adar stalks through the red smoke. The name, Southlands, no longer exists. Unashamed Weasel Waldreg, asks, what should we call it instead, Lord Father? This is Mordor now. The orcs are home. The final episode 8 begins in the Greenwood, the stranger makes his way through moss and stone and tree. In his head, he hears Nori's long gone assurance, you're not a peril. You're good. A branch cracks, and he turns to see a familiar cloaked figure. Nori, he asks with hope. But when she blinks, her eyes turn icy blue. She folds in on herself and then unfurls again as the dweller as the other two mysterious figures emerge from the trees. But they're not here to hurt him, we come to serve you, the ascetic whispers, Lord Sauron. Two little men Nori does. Moving to a region, Elrond and Celebrimbor are worried. Gil-galad is coming, and they still have no way of saving the elves. Just then, Galadriel gallops into the ivy-covered courtyard. Elrond and Galadriel are surprised to see each other, especially Elrond, who believed his friend was safely behind a wall of clouds in Valinor. But there will be time for reunion and reconciliation later, for now, the wounded Halbrand is in a very bad way. They've ridden for six days without resting, and he cannot stand without assistance. Because I believed in you, my task here was not yet complete. All I could do was swim. I need to drown now. I have missed you. What are we to do? Swim. Elvish medicine works fast, it seems, soon after, Halbrand is back on his feet and looking for Galadriel in the workshop. The Celebrimber. Halbrand asks with astonishment when he learns where he is. Flattery will get you absolutely everywhere with Celebrimber, and Halbrand appears to know that. He takes up the mithril, and suggests combining it with other ores to stretch and amplify its power. So we learn to combine them, the gold added to iron to make a blade lighter, and alloy to amplify the qualities of your ore. Back in Numenor, Farazan is at the king's own sickbed. Soon, black flags will fill our harbor, Farazan tells the assembled apprentices, chosen to propose designs for the king's impending tomb. As Irian takes her turn sketching the king alone, he grabs her, and speaks as if to his daughter years ago, begging her to return to the old ways to save their island. He opens a door and warns that, I looked for too long, and now I cannot separate what is from what was, what was from what will be. Irian follows his prompting through the door, where she pulls away the palantir's velvet drape. We know what she'll see if she touches it. Before she does, it's back to a region, where Gil-galad meets with Elrond, Celebrimber, and Galadriel, who has traded her armor for a bath and the draped velvet in delicate gold of the city. Celebrimber suggests they make a mithril crown, Gil-galad, the resident crown wearer, doesn't love that. But Celebrimber is insistent. We are on the cusp of crafting a new kind of power. A power not of the flesh, but over flesh. Galadriel has heard those words before, in the Southlands that would soon be obliterated by fire. Adar spoke them then, and now Celebrimber is, under Halbrand's influence. Gil-galad reluctantly agrees to give Celebrimber a few more months, and the workshop is suddenly bustling with smiths firing and forging, including Halbrand. Galadriel watches from the shadows, newly suspicious, and asks an elf discreetly for any records of the Southlands' royal bloodlines. Back in the Greenwood, 
the women tell the stranger that his mysterious constellation can only be seen in Run, their home. The ascetic and the nomad assure him, every being that walks or crawls shall be your slaves, for you are Lord Sauron. Methinks the creepy magic ladies doth protest too much, personally. But as they speak, the elements wake for the stranger, embers circling in the very trees shaking violently. And cold, in your room, every being that walks, or for for you, our Lord Sauron. It is too much, the dweller knocks him out, and the ascetic and the nomad bind his wrists to a tree. A patch of moss moves in the background. It's Sadik, camouflaged and spying with Nori, Poppy, Megan Richards, and Marigold. Marigold distracts the women, while Nori and Sadik untie the unconscious stranger. But then Marigold stumbles upon the stranger on the forest floor, somehow both tied to the tree and lying here in the tall grass. The ruse becomes clear, the bound stranger opens his icy blue eyes, and his cloak sloughs away like dead leaves to reveal the dweller. The nomad buries a dagger in Sadik's chest, red blooming across his shirt. Suddenly, the wind kicks up, and thunder rumbles. The stranger, the real stranger, rises and sends a tremor through the ground. The dweller lifts him twisting into the air with her staff and tosses him down, then puts both of her soot-caked hands into the fire and blows lashing flames into the trees sheltering the fleeing Harfoots. Nori cannot leave her friend, but he begs her to get away from him, fearing he'll hurt her again. He's speaking in full sentences now, they showed me what I am. But Nori's not buying it. You choose by what you do. You're here to help. I know it. And help is badly needed, as the dweller prepares to set Marigold, Poppy, and Sadik afire over Nori's anguished screams. But suddenly the fires in the trees and in her hands are quenched. Now the women understand, he is not Sauron. The women of Run are lit from within, turning to screaming skeletons before dissolving into clouds of fluttering moths. But Sadek cannot celebrate, his wound is mortal. He doesn't mind, he'll soon be reunited with his left-behind wife. As the rising sun turns the scorched forest gold, he shuts his eyes against this warmer, truer light for the last time, surrounded by his loyal friends who will wait for him always. The Numenorean ship is heading home. Elendil is below deck, where Muriel offers him leave as he recovers from the seeming loss of his son. The consequences of Elendil's trust in Galadriel have been unforeseen and terrible, but he will ensure that the ends are worth what they have each lost. Muriel allows herself a moment of rest against his shoulder. But it can't last long, They've reached Numenor, where Elendil sees what Muriel cannot, the black flags draped around the harbor. The king has died. What has happened? It refuses every oh, effort. Seen an unseen world, seem to use enough pressure to fuse the very heavens with the earth. They will be forward. It may take time. time. Perhaps we've been pushing ourselves too hard. Pushing ourselves to... Supposing we've been using too much force. Coaxed. Meaning together. Now if that's true, we've been, we've been doing it all inside out. Back in a region, Galadriel has gotten her answer. On the banks of a river, an open scroll hangs limply from her hand. As if summoned, Halbrand bounds in with the news that the mithril is too powerful for one object, so they'll make two. 
but she will not come to see the progress. There is no king of the Southlands, she tells him flatly. The last man to bear your crest died over a thousand years ago. He had no heir. The jig is up, but he doesn't seem to care. I told you I found it on a dead man, Halbrand shrugs. Tell me your name, she asks, a whisper thick with what she already knows. I have had many names, he smirks. She tries to stab him, but he stops her without blinking. Her ears ring, and she falls. When she hits the ground, she is home in Valinor, where she hears Finrod's voice. Get out of my mind, she spits, but the possibility of seeing her brother again is too wonderful, and she turns to him, beaming. My task was to ensure peace, he insists. But I learned that was Sauron's task as well. This is not her Finrod, he's Sauron's. Tears spilling down her cheeks, Galadriel walks away from the person she loves most. Galadriel, look at me, Finrod screams, and then she's back on the raft, suddenly in the middle of the sundering seas with Halbrand. He only ever told her the truth, he insists, he said he'd done evil, and she told him his future need not be bound by his past. In the water's reflection, he offers her a vision of their future, a powerful pair, Galadriel standing beside the towering, iron-armored Sauron. I would make you a queen, you bind me to the light, he insists. And I bind you to power. Together, we can save this Middle-earth. But Galadriel knows the difference between saving and ruling, and she chooses instead to press the blade to his throat. Behind them, over the expanse of sea, bright blue bursts through clouds on one side, while a furious storm gathers on the other. In his fury, Halbrand's eyes are ringed in an angry red, the pupils only slits, the eyes of Sauron at last. They scream, lightning flashes, and Galadriel is plunged into the sea once more. But this time it is not Halbrand who rescues her, her true friend Elrond rouses her from the river. Halbrand is gone. Where did we first meet? The seaside when I was first orphaned. I was alone. A young half-elven boy without friend or kin. Galadriel! Galadriel! What has happened? Galadriel runs to the workshop, where Celebrimber is alone. She does not expect Halbrand will return. She insists that they make three objects, for balance, and that they go only to elves. But Celebrimber needs very pure gold and silver to alloy with the mithril, ores from Valinor. True creation requires sacrifice, he tells her as she looks at her brother's cherished blade in her hand. Perhaps she can finally put it down in the service of what she hopes will be peace. Back in the grove, Nori asks if the stranger remembers anything more yet, but he only has flashes and must go to run to learn more. She asks if Ister is his kind. In your tongue, that's wise one, or wizard, he answers. Wizard, you say. You're really not coming with us, are you? The power's greater than our own. In those moments, it's our task to make our feet go where our hearts... Wish. Sounds a bit like an adventure. You know, adventures... They must be shared. I think I've had about as much adventure as any Harfoot could ever hope for. Meanwhile, the Harfoots are packing up to travel, this time on foot. Nori joins her family, but they drop an already packed bag at her feet, they're sending her off to adventure with the stranger. You're part of something bigger now, Largo tells her. She takes a tearful last leave from her proud mother and her beloved father, her own North Star. Poppy bursts through the crowd to clutch her friend tightly and to make me very weepy indeed. And then Nori is gone, all the way off trail, but never walking alone. As they set their course, the stranger has a piece of wisdom for her, when in doubt, Eleanor Brandyfoot, always follow your nose. He may not have a name yet, but that is the familiar and very good advice of the future Gandalf the Grey. Galadriel places her dagger into Celebrimber's fires to be melted down.
The molten gold and silver is poured into a cauldron with the mithril. As Celebrimber twists and molds the new alloy into rings, Elrond finds the abandoned scroll in the reeds. He rushes back to the workshop, where the beauty of the first three glittering rings of power stops his mouth. The rings are reflected in an eye, an eye that also reflects the fires of Mount Doom. As this first season comes to a close, a black-cloaked Halbrand treks through the ruined stone of smoke-choked Mordor. You choose by what you do, after all. He is Sauron, king of the Southlands, and, if he has his way, of all Middle-earth. He will seek to rule them all, and in the darkness bind them.